So I am here with Ralph McLaughlin, Chief Economist and Senior Vice President of Analytics for House. Thanks so much for hanging out with us today. Sure. Thanks, Emily. So Ralph, tell me a little bit about your background. Where are you based? And I want to know more about your background specifically in urban planning and your economic you know, chops. <laughs> sure. So uh, I'm, I'm Ralph McLaughlin. I'm Chief Economist and Senior Vice President of Analytics uh, for House. Um, I have a unorthodox background when it comes to um, economics, in particular housing economics. Uh, most housing economists started out studying economics uh, and then fell into housing. I started out my career um, studying housing from a much broader perspective, not just economics, but also geography and, and, uh, and sociology and design, and then actually got very interested in economics as my career progressed. Uh, and that's how I became um, a housing economist. And like you had mentioned, my background, I do have some background actually in, in urban planning, and I got interested in housing uh, you know, after spending uh, about uh, six months in Europe when I was 19 years old, and thought, oh, wow, people live very different here in Europe compared to um, the US, uh, and in particular in California where I'm from. So I was interested in what are some of the reasons behind that, and um, uh, economics, urban economics, is is, is part of that. Uh, so that's um, that's who I am. That's where I've been. Um, I've had a varied career from uh, being a very um, poorly paid uh, academic, uh, but a job I really liked uh, teaching first in Australia and then in my hometown of San Jose, uh, California, to uh, the um, to the private sector side, I uh, was chief economist at uh, Truly for a while and deputy, deputy chief economist at, uh, at CoreLogic, and I've done some public uh, service in my day. I served as a housing commissioner for the city of San Jose for a couple years um, while I was on faculty at San Jose State. So that's, that's my background. You have really covered every aspect of housing. You've gone from the MLS <laughs> vendor to the portal. You've worked in the public housing realm. That's really awesome. Most of the economists that I speak with have a more traditional academic economic background, but um, I love, I, I am a Hauser and love housing too. My, I started my career in government affairs for the association. So I like that you understand that aspect of it. So I know that we'll have fun today. Tell me a little bit about what House does. It's a pretty new startup. People are not super familiar with the concept. How do you describe it? Uh, basically, we are an alternative uh, to housing finance that doesn't involve debt. So if you are a home buyer, uh, pretty much for the last uh, you know, 100 years in the US, if you wanted to buy a house, you had to go get a loan, uh, and which involves uh, obviously uh, debt. We provide an alternative path, which is we will co-invest with a home buyer. So if a home buyer wants to buy a house, wants to put 10% down, we'll put 90% down. Instead of that 90% down being a loan, we co invest in the house uh, and slowly every month the home buyer pays us a fee. Um, part of that is an option fee to retain the option to do whatever they want with the house. And then the other part of the fee actually goes to buying shares of the co-investment back from us. So basically we just partner with the home buyer uh, proportional to the amount of money that each side sets in, not unlike uh, say a commercial real estate deal where you have partners going in on it. Um, we do that on the owner occupancy side. And uh, you know we, we think it's a, a valuable alternative to um, financing one's home that doesn't involve debt. Our product also was uh, flexible in a couple different ways. Uh, one, uh, you know, several times a year at the home buyer's uh, discretion, they can ask for um, some, uh, they can cash in some of their shares. So if you need money to say build a new deck or do a repair on a house, um, you can just come ask to us and we'll provide, uh, you know, some, some cash in exchange for shares back from the partnership. And probably most importantly and relevant to today, if uh, one of our um, co-investors, our partners, say, loses a job, um, we will allow them to go for an undefined um, number of months without having to make a payment. Um, and in exchange, we will just slowly purchase shares back uh, from the co-investor. And then when the person gets back on their feet, they can continue to make payments, all without having to go through a foreclosure process, all without having to short sale a house or file, fire sale a house. So it's a win-win from, from, from both sides. Uh, of, of the coin, uh, at least from our perspective, and we think there, um, you know, is a, is a you know non-trivial demand uh, in the marketplace for this kind of product. So, so how many markets are you co-invested in right now? 
So right now we are in California, Oregon, and Washington with um, a goal to expand nationally uh, sometime in the next uh, 12 to 24 months. Yeah. And, and how long, how far into your co-investments are you that now we're experiencing this kind of economic term? Because what an interesting test of the waters, right? Yeah, exactly. So uh, we started doing our first deals in July of last year. Um, and we've actually had the, uh, our, one of our first um, co-investors come to us to ask for um, you know, some, some relief. Mm -hmm. uh, so right now they are um, getting relief from us. They're not having to make any payments um, until July when this person thinks they'll get back on their feet. And we just are slowly buying a small amount of shares back in exchange for them not making a payment. We've also had um, uh, a handful of other uh, uh, partners that have come to us and say, hey, I need a little extra cash to, you know, get me through uh, this tough cycle. And we've said, sure, okay, here's some cash. And in exchange, we get some um, shares back. And um, uh, that's pro provided to be uh, pretty, pretty valuable and, and pretty flexible and a, and a, and a key feature um, that our existing customers have said they really like. So we've, we're going to have uh, some testimonials coming out soon. So you don't have to, you know, hear it from us. These are actually going to be real people, not like the actors that, you know, the fake actors <laughs> right. that get paid on online right. or on, on the radio. These are real people, real customers with us and, and um, not scripted. And they're just going to, um, you know, tell us, um, you know, tell the world uh, what they think of our product. So um, how, I think it'll be valuable. how deeply will you allow the, the balance to shift when you're allowing the co investor to, to take out their shares and access that cash equity? Great question, Emily. The minimum is 10%. Okay. So you could be in essentially a 90 10 relationship with house owning 90% of the property, you owning 10. That's correct. Yep. Okay. Uh, and, you know, I think our average, uh, uh, balance right now, at least going into a partnership, is about 15, um, 15 And you know, to give you an idea, um, you know, a five percent ownership stake in a house would would get someone through if something you know happened to them. Theoretically, it would get them through you know 12 to 16 months. So we think having that you know having that minimum of 10 and, and the ideal a little just a little bit more it doesn't have to be 20, but a little bit more really um, puts our partner in a very good position to you know weather life's disruptions. And then how early on in the transaction, I mean, I, I would expect that you get engaged at the same time that a lender would be engaged, right? It, it's a, at the point that the uh, consumer is working with their agent to identify the right property, they may have also already reached out to you to establish what the, what the credit could look like or what kind of um, qualification they should seek. That's exactly right. Anyone interested in buying a house and using our product should, um, you know, approach us as early uh, in their house hunt as, as possible. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be before they found the home in their dreams. We can move pretty quickly, actually. That's one of the advantages we have uh, to say lenders. Um, you know, we can move pretty quickly. We can close deals. I think the quickest we close the deal has probably been in about a week. Um, you know, on average, it probably takes between two to three weeks. Uh, appraisals, as you probably know, yeah. today are a little bit slower well, and, and yeah, harder to come by. Yeah, everything's a little slower right now. <laughs> right. That, that's right. right. But during normal times, you know, we, we expect between a seven and 14 day close. That's, that's our target. And then that, that option fee, the fees that they paid to retain, you know, maximum ownership and flexibility in the property. How does that compare to the interest that they might pay on a mortgage? Yeah. So, so how does uh, the fee shake out essentially? It, it, Exactly. So the fee, um, two thirds of a payment uh, go to our option fee, one third goes to buying back um, shares. Now to put it into perspective, if you were to get a 30 year mortgage, um, two thirds of your mortgage payment, um, or I'm sorry, one third of your mortgage payment uh, wouldn't be reached till you're like year seven or year eight in the deal. So, the, you know, our product is, again, not for everyone. If you plan to stay in your house for 30 years and you think your market's really going to go up, you know, explode, you know, go get a 30-year mortgage. You know, we're not going to, we're not going to stretch the, the truth. We're going to be very, very open and honest. But, it, you know, if you, especially if you're a first-time home buyer, you might think, oh, I want to buy my starter home now. And then five to seven years, uh, you know, I, I might want to trade up. We're a much better, much better product, a much fairer product. Because you equity faster. Product. Yeah, that, that's right. Yep. And how many of the transactions that you manage include realtor agent representation? Uh, right now, um, I think of all of the deals that we've had um, that were on the purchase side, because we do purchase and restructure, of sure. all the deals we've done on the purchase, purchase, it's it's involved a realtor on both sides of the transaction. Good answer. Um, 
<laughs> now, now we do on the, um, uh, you know, we, we are a licensed broker in many states and we do have the option of um, actually selling a house at basically very low cost if a, um, if a partner wants to use us. Uh, we certainly don't have any obligations, don't put any obligations on, uh, on the homeowner to use us, but if they want, um, you know, all, basically all they need to pay is a, um, is a buyer side um, commission. Uh, yeah. Now, you know, we're not, we're not a full service uh, real estate firm and, and certainly, you know, we're not going to provide, uh, you know, as many bells and whistles as, um, uh, you know, a realtor would, uh, but we, we do retain that, um, that, that option for the home buyer. Okay. Awesome. Well, it sounds like a really interesting concept. I mean, how prudent, you know, to have that type of flexibility for consumers at this time. Um, sounds like a silver lining that you're getting to experience the full flex of the product through this environment, which where some people are really struggling, you're getting to sort of prove up your value in some ways, which is That's awesome. That's exactly right. I mean, when I, you know, I joined the company in December, I've been an advisor since uh, about June or July last year. And, you know, I, I think all of us, uh, you know, at that time, were thinking, oh, well, maybe we'll get to prove this out on the flexible side in two, three, four years. The economy was looking very healthy. <laughs> For a month. That's and, another option, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> another month. And, and yeah, here, here we are. So it, it yeah. actually, um, you know, it does feel very good to, you know, be able to help keep people in their homes during such a a terrible um, health and, and um, economic crisis. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the economy overall. Um, Zillow's chief economist has echoed what we've heard others say in the sense that they're expecting a checkmarked recession. So a deep dive and then a pretty steep climb back up again. What are you, ex what are you expecting? What should, what are we hearing from you? A great question. Our forecast is a little different uh, from those that you just mentioned. Um, we're expecting uh, what we're calling a flying W-shaped recovery. A flying uh, W. And a flying W. Yeah. Straight out of Harry any, Potter. <laughs> Harry Potter. I mean, if any, if there's any um, Weezer fans here, you know oh, the yeah. Weezer logo. <laughs> that's a flying flying W. You have it kind of kinked a little a little one way. And basically, um, what we think is going to happen um, is that we are coming to the end of the first leg of the W. So we've seen this big crash after this black swan event, right? Um, we do see signs that there is actually pent up demand from what would have been probably a robust uh, uh, housing, uh, uh, home buying season. And, and, and maybe you can attest to some things that, have, that you've seen in the ground in, in Austin, but yeah. all signs were this spring, you know, was gonna be a fantastic um, season. We don't think that that fundamental demand has necessarily gone away. It's just been pushed back. So after this big drop, this first leg of this flying W that we think this pent up demand is gonna come back it's probably going to come back in the summer, maybe not to the extent that it would have been without the pandemic, but we think it's going to come back. And that's the middle of the W. Mm -hmm. uh, then as we go into the off season, uh, we think there's, there's two things. One, the real steady equilibrium of demand, what argu arguably is going to be lower because lots of people have lost their, their jobs um, and it's been tragic, combined with the possibility of uh, the pandemic coming back or the virus coming back is going to lead to a, a shorter um, not a steep fall again. And that would be that third leg of the W. And then the final leg of the W, the flying part is early 2021 as you know, if things really get back on their feet, the impact of the virus is behind us and the economy really starts to recover. Um, and whether or not you think it's Nike shaped or check shaped or flying W shaped, um, you know, most, uh, most economists are thinking that the rebound isn't you know, it's really going to start to take full effect beginning of next year. So we're really sort of splitting hairs about what's going to happen between now and then. Yeah. So it, you're just talking about two check marks instead of one, essentially, right? We had a significant a crash. The summer is going to pick back up because the uh, factors leading to what was really truly supposed to be another record year in the housing market, at least in Austin, Texas, um, are still largely intact with the exception of that percentage of the population that's experienced such a setback that they're going to need more time to recover. And then pending what happens with the virus in the fall, we see another di dive and then we pick back up again for a more long-term stretch, hopefully, at the first quarter of 21. Exactly. I mean, you said that much more eloquently than I could have ever said that. So thank you, uh, Emily. Good job and, to interpret, speak, and create it for the people. So, <laughs> that's that. a great job interpreting a comedy. Uh, yeah. And, and one of the reasons why we really think there's going to be a strong rebound um, has to do with fundamental demand side um, parts of the economy, which gets into 
demographics. I mean, right. we have a very large share of the U.S. population, basically second only to boomers in millennials uh, and Gen Z, that do want to own homes. They've told us for years they want to own homes. Um, there were very strong signs of last year that they were the ones that were really buying houses, uh, but they still don't own homes at rates that their parents did when they were that age. But we think that's um, you know really going to be a big boon for the economy, uh, you know, over the next five years. How does so, that pair with those who have most been impacted by the economic turn? So wh where do millennials shake out in those who, in the, in the groups that have been most impacted by job loss? Yeah, the unfortunate thing is that uh, those um, from an economic standpoint that were probably um, hurt most that were working, um, you know, in say uh, retail, in service and leisure sectors that have been hit very hard do tend to be younger, um, you know, younger, younger buyers, but also uh, on, the, on the flip side, and, and you'll see this sort of in your neck of the woods, you know, a lot of the, the, the tech economy, which, you know, has been you know, relatively unscathed. There's been layoffs for sure, but no, that, that's a happy. really they're happy healthy, at home. growing they're part. They're happy at home. They're 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 young. They're yes. they're young. They, they are their they babies. Have, <laughs> yeah. Babies, but they have they have skills needed to grow their careers, and they may yeah. not be as impacted as much. So um, it's certainly going to be at the least a very big speed bump for some of those households. Um, but they're but you know you might think of households that. Um, you know, weren't in industries that were affected that were ready to buy houses this spring. They had that down payment. Um, and as long as they didn't go through any big economic disruption, might be seeing this as an opportunity to actually get into the market. Rates, um, you know, are very, very low, much lower than they've been for uh, a long time. Yeah. Uh, the only downside you may have seen is that inventory, you know, sellers have almost freaked out more than buyers in this market. And, and that's, you know, not going to lead to, uh, a widespread, uh, you know, collapse of the housing market. I don't think we're going to see as many foreclosures. The government's got, you know, some really solid um, uh, plans in place to help keep people in their homes, and that's not mm -hmm. likely to lead to a, a, you know, a major drop in prices uh, or a major increase in foreclosures. Yeah, I mean, all of those facets you just described are absolutely uh, paramount in the Austin market. The tech economy is still driving hard. Those kids are happy, and they are still going to want to buy property because they believe in that investment. Um, tech continues to remain a strong industry in the sense of weathering the storm, you know, overall. And then inventory is a terrible problem in, in most <laughs> urban markets, but especially in Austin, Texas, we've been under two months um, balanced inventory across the whole of the region, even worse in many parts of Austin proper. And people freaked out in April, which was understandable. And they pulled their listings or they put them pending, you know, put them in T status and hung out on the temporary line for a while. And so I do think that where there might have been a good deal for a couple of weeks there, there's no deal to be had for a buyer right now. This is, um, you know, sellers need to get their listings back on the market so that we can get capacity opened up for the demand that we've got pent up. That's and it exactly was like right. that before the virus. So it's worse now. Yeah, I mean, the inventory problem has been bad. I mean, you know that. It's been bad, bad for years. Bad. This is not <laughs> yeah. something that was caused by the pandemic, but the yeah. pandemic has just taken it to uh, a whole lower level, unfortunately. But um, let's talk but, about the inventory problem in the yeah. context of your background a little bit. So, you know, many of us believed that one of the tools that helps uh, resolve the issue of capacity is to build denser, especially in cities like ours, where we are not very dense yet, despite what people think about Austin being incredibly progressive. Um, it's a somewhat flat and sprawly sort of city. Um, and, you know, we've been having a conversation about an overhaul of our entire land use code here. So we've been having a, a very existential conversation about what kind of Austin we want to be in the future. People um, generally were starting to, to work towards having a greater understanding and acceptance of a more urban uh, um, community, one that was a little denser. But then we've seen density play this really interesting and scary role in the context of the pandemic. How do we balance out those fears with what we know um, academically about the value of density as it relates to capacity? Well, that's a great question that I'm not going to have the perfect answer to in the time of this podcast. Well, now but I what... accepted perfection, <laughs> Ralph. <laughs> well, you know, I've had my uh, academic hat off for several years now. Sure. So, uh, uh, apologies. But no, I, I mean, that, that's going to be a fundamental dichotomy of what happened. My, my guess is that cities are not going to go away and the demand um, to actually live in denser environments is um, you know, going to increase. We might see a short-term impact of, of this virus. Um, 
push some people to live further from um, you know, density. Uh, but I think overall, the value of our urban economies, the value of agglomeration econ economies uh, has only strengthened over the years. And I don't think the virus is going to disrupt that. Uh, however, you know, I think there are, um, you know, there's going to be some reconsideration that happens within some of these firms that are benefiting from density. And, you know, that's what attracts people to, to live in, in dense places right. in that maybe, maybe, um, uh, the importance of cities uh, isn't going to go away. In fact, it might strengthen, but maybe the importance of an individual uh, being in a dense environment 24-7 uh, is, isn't what we thought it was. Maybe someone could um, you know, live outside of a city or, or split time between places uh, and still reap the benefits both from the individual perspective, but also the firm perspective of, of that dense, uh, dense urban environment. Um, you know, zoning regulations, of course, um, play uh, play a big deal. Um, you know, my my as an economist, my per personal perspective is that um, you know we, we need to let the market dictate what the densities um, should be. Right. Um, you know, people want to live in all sorts of different environments. People want to live in rural environments. People want to live in dense urban environments. That we should allow that choice for however people um, want to live, and you know, not necessarily, um, you know, restrict people's um, choices. Uh, but uh, again, you know, the the pandemic has, um, I, I think, led to people needing to, you know, sort of reconsider their life choices, reconsidering where they want to um, spend time. But I would, I would suspect. Um, you know, in a, in a few years that, uh, you know, we as a society probably uh, will have a um, much looser memory or, or much less of a desire to actually leave cities than maybe some of us have now. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. It's fresh. And, and it makes sense that we would be somewhat reactive towards the kind of traumatic experiences that we've all been managing through. Um, sort of related, but a little different. You wrote an article recently about pre-COVID commute to work times and the cost of that in the context of people seeking to move back into the city and um, wanting that kind of density. But then now we've seen all of these businesses, mine included, shift to these fully remote environments and open up the, a, a new you know, conversation about how long some of us will last like this and if we're making permanent shifts towards these remote work environment. So if we make the shift towards a remote work environment, the, you know, having the fourth worst congestion in the country doesn't matter in Austin, Texas, as much as it used to, in part because our congestion is getting better, but also because I don't have to sit in it any longer. So then how do my, what, what changes am I making from a consumer perspective to maybe not care as much about, you know, where I am? Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting that even before this pandemic, the share of people working remotely was at a historic high. Yeah. Um, you know, and by historic high, it was by 5%. So you know, still, like still a pretty, tiny historic high, right? A, a tiny <laughs> historic high, but the trend is what matters, of course. Sure. Uh, and so um, I think what's going to happen with this pandemic is that um, there's going to be um, a certain share of the population that has always wanted to work remotely. Um, but has never been able to find the occupation or find the employer to be able to do that. And then on the flip side, there's going to be em employers that never ever considered having a remote dispersed workforce uh, that suddenly they're forced into it and realize maybe it's not as bad uh, as they were thinking. And yeah, so mine it's going to be, you're <laughs> yeah. included. Yeah, me, me, me too, working remotely. And it's the proportion of each that if you multiply them together, will tell you, and I don't know what that number is, but that will tell you essentially um, what share is likely to um, live and move and migrate to, um, you know, to, to rural areas. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they perhaps will give up um, you know, coming into the city, but they may just not do it every day. They may do it a few times a week instead of um, you know, uh, four or five times. Yeah. Uh, so, we did this interesting thing. We, um, I surveyed my staff recently. We're having the conversation about what it looks like to reopen the facility, at least now just at a conceptual place, not, not yet in the context with the staff of the liabilities of doing that. But, um, you know, we asked them, would you rather work full-time remote now that you've had that experience? And even my young, fairly millennial staff said, no, I really want a hybrid. I want to have my cake and eat it too. I'd like to work from home sometimes. And then I want to come into the office and see my friends occasionally. And, you know, it's, it's funny because from a business operations standpoint, 
creating space for both is very taxing. So we're going to have to make some hard decisions about how to, how to do that and still most importantly serve our 14,000 members. But it, it's yeah. been an interesting conversation and the, they surprised me by still wanting to have that anchor in the office sometimes. There's just, you know, we can get close to substitutes, right? So this is kind of close uh, to having, um, you know, an in-person conversation. But what I think what is lost and, and maybe what your staff is demanding and certainly what, um, you know, many of the employees at House are demanding is the organic interaction, yeah. right? The, the conversations, right. the drive-by, the drive-by conversation, the coffee, the water cooler conversation, the, hey, do you want to go grab a bite to eat and just mm -hmm. randomly chat, you know, and, and there, there's a lot of, um, you know, knowledge spillover and productivity that actually comes out of those interactions. And that's not something that's easy to do unless we all have our Zoom on turned on all the time yeah. you know, with everyone at our workplace. It just, so, um, you know, for those reasons, I think there's still going to be demand to have people, you know, come and live in, you know, a central workplace and live in, live in cities. Um, yeah. On the flip side, though, there's also potential productivity gains um, that could come from uh, firms actually moving towards a more distributed workforce. Um, and that is they don't necessarily have to hire just from within their given market. They, they can hire from anywhere. And so, right. uh, you know, that potentially lowers um, uh, the wages that they have to pay. If someone, you know, can live in, in rural Montana mm -hmm. uh, and their workplace is in San Francisco, well, the employee in San Francisco, the employer in San Francisco doesn't have to pay them San Francisco wages. Yeah. Uh, and the conversely- developers in Montana better get their skills ready because- That's, exa that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I got a friend who, who moved up there several years ago. Yeah. Hiring a postcard a, saying, you need to hiring here. stack <laughs> workers in Austin is pretty expensive too. So I'd be happy to get one out of Montana. <laughs> That's funny. Well, um, let's wrap up with a speed round. Are you good with that? I'm good with that. Let's play. Okay. What is your favorite beer? My understanding is that you're a beer connoisseur on Twitter occasionally. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> my favorite, oh, I'm going through right now. My favorite is um, Eggenberg. It's an Austrian Pilsner. Uh, oh. But, you know, these things change on a, you know, weekly. Yeah, is this like a quarantine favorite or <laughs> is <it> seasonal? <laughs> this is a seasonal favorite. Uh, of course, growing up in California, I, I, you know, I have that certain innate hoppy uh, desire that's on my palate. But, you know, over the years, I've gravitated more towards uh, good German and Austrian um, pilsners. That's awesome. Uh, who are your favorite Twitter accounts to follow? Uh, so, so many good ones out there. Uh, I mean, to, to quickly name a few, um, Bill McBride. Um, runs the blog Calculated Risk, and you know he predicted the 2007, 2008 meltdown. Just a fantastic, um, you know, wealth of knowledge there. Uh, and then also a um, a colleague of mine, uh, Len Kiefer, who's deputy chief economist at uh, Freddie Mac, just makes some amazing data visualizations. Uh, just really, really amazing stuff. I mean, there's lots of good stuff uh, out there, of course. Uh, Joint Center for Housing Studies Twitter account. If you're a housing, you know, nerd like we are, they're always yeah. good to uh, good good to follow. Awesome. What's your favorite city in the U.S. and why? Uh, I, well, I, you know, I vote with my feet. So I'm here in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. So uh, oh. I'm going to say Old Town, Alexandria, Virginia has got to be one of my, um, one of my favorites. Uh, also very uh, partial to, um, uh, to, to the Sierra Nevada. So not necessarily a city, but uh, a region, Sierra Nevada of, of California. Uh, in particular, the, the High Sierra is uh, holds a good good place in my heart. Uh, and uh, you know, from the actual, you know, hey, I want to go on vacation, hang out in the city. Uh, I mean, it's it's hard to beat New Orleans. Oh, yeah. Well, as a as a Cajun myself, I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's your favorite podcast? Podcast. Oh, I listen to a lot of different ones. I, I like Radio Lab. Uh, I listened to some Radio Lab podcasts this morning. Me too. Um, <clears throat> that's uh, that's a good one. Uh, the real estate guys, uh, you know, in investing. I'm, I'm a sort of small scale real estate investor myself, and they always have a wealth of, of, of knowledge. And then to explore new music, I'm a big fan of W. B. Walker's also radio show. If you haven't heard that, uh, uh, streaming out of uh, Dingus, West Virginia. He's a uh, uh, he's a railroad conductor, and when he's not, uh, you know, riding the coal trains on the East Coast, he actually does a podcast for a lot of local musicians out of uh, uh, Eastern Kentucky and, and uh, Western West Virginia. It's a great, great place to discover new uh, and, and homegrown music. I love that. I love that podcasting gives uh, li like light to people that would never have had that kind of voice before. I think that's special and neat. 
there just are not that many, you know, train conductors that are out telling their story. So uh, that's exa exactly right. And these are things, these are stories we never would hear of. It's probably music yeah, we never would, yeah, yeah. would hear of, you know, even 10, 20, 15 years ago. It's an awesome medium. Well, Ralph, you've been a delight. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Good luck at house. Uh, we're excited to see how it shakes out through the rest of this uh, economic downturn. And we'll look for our second check mark later and see if you were right. Thanks a lot. I'm really pleasure right. was mine. Thanks so much.